All right. Um, my name is Regina Obey, and I'm a PostGIS developer on, on, and also on the PostGIS team. And I also am president of a company called Paragon Corporation, and we do database consulting. Um, my husband and I recently wrote a book which came out this month, um, PostGIS in Action, third edition. And it's available on Amazon and also for directly from our publisher, Manning. And you can also get the ebook from Manning. And he, here's the live link. And we also wrote a book, PG Routing, which is a bit old now. And we're working on the next edition, the second edition, which will cover the three and four, the three series, possibly four if we take that long to release. Um, and Locate Press is currently running a, um, a special for Phosphor-G, 40% off on all eBooks, including ours, of course. All right, so before I start, I wanna just briefly go over where you can get PostGIS. PostGIS is a very um, mature product and you can get it from a number of places. You can get it, we have a Docker repository, which is managed by PostGIS group and some other um, part of the, some other PostGIS community members. There's, if you're running Ubuntu or Debian, you can get it from app.postgresql.org. And they tend to have newer versions than what you get directly from um, Debian or Ubuntu mirrors. And then if you're running CentOS or Red Hat or any of those flavors, you can get from yum.postgresql.org. And for Windows, I build the, win I, I'm, I manage the Windows build and that's available via the Stack Builder when you install um, a Postgres on Windows via EDB. And of course the manual um, covers all the functions that I'll be going through here. All right, so the topics we're gonna cover, and I should probably put, I, I think I put this in chat already, but I'm gonna put it again. So here's the link the slides and it will have all the links and the it'll have a link to the code so the topics we're going to cover is loading data and my favorite way of loading data into postgis is using a um, an extension called ogr fdw and this is a an extension that builds on top of gdal it's a thin wrapper if you're familiar with gdal um, that's a Swiss army knife for loading data. And this is a way of using it directly in the database for loading vector data. And then we also go through some very common post-GIS um, tasks like taking measurements, data simplification, reprojecting, doing proximity analysis, breaking geometries apart, breaking lines apart. And I'll try to cover some post-GIS raster, but I don't expect to get to that. Okay, so the links to the live demos are here. And I am going to switch the screen to the live demo. Okay, so the first thing before you can do anything is of course you have to install PostGIS. And the way I like to do it, you create a database, a, a Postgres database. You set the search path to all the things that you commonly want to connect to, making sure you have the schema where you're going to install PostGIS. Um, the default schema, if you don't specify, is the public schema. But I usually like to dedicate a post a schema specifically to PostGIS extensions because there are lots of functions. There are thousands of functions in there. So the first step you do is to um, create the schema you're going to install PostGIS into. And you can only install PostGIS once in a database, so keep that in mind. And I've already got it installed, so it's just going to tell me that I've already got all these things done. And I usually have a contrib to install other extensions that are not PostGIS. 
All right, and here's the step where you install Postgres. And I already have Postgres, so it's just telling me I've already got Postgres installed. And since Postgres 3.0, the raster support is in a separate extension. And the reason is just because there's so many functions for raster. And there's so many functions for um, Postgres. You can see 12. If you include Postgres, Postgres Raster, you have 1,212 functions and the Postgres SFC goal. And the same with SFC goal. And if you're using topology, which we're not going to cover, um, and also for geocoding and address standardizing, you'd use these other functions. And when you need to upgrade Postgres, we have a function called Postgres Extensions Upgrade that you can run. And it will bring you to the latest version. All the extensions that you have installed, it will upgrade them to the latest version you have installed. And then you can check what you have installed. All right, so for the data that I'm going to be loading, I'm going to put it in the schema called Phosphor G 2021. And for staging the data, I usually try to load the data raw in a separate schema that I call staging and then clean it up before I load it into my final. OK, so now the presentation. So the OGR FDW extension is not an extension that's included with Postgres. It's packaged separately, and you can find details about it at this link. It's If you're on Windows, it is part of the Postgres Windows bundle. So once you install the Postgres Windows bundle, you could just run create extension. For other systems like um, uh, Yum and, and Apt, you have to install the binary separately, but they do have those available too. And once you have OGR FTW installed, you can check which version you're running. And it'll give you this information. It'll tell you the GDAL version because it is a thin wrapper around GDAL. And um, fairly recently, um, the OGR FDW extension introduced a function called OGR FDW drivers. And this will tell you all the driver, all the different vector data types that you can read. So you can see I can read 83 different vector data types. And you'll notice that some of them aren't really vector, like Excel files and um, open office files, those aren't, and ODBC isn't really. So since um, OGR FTW is a spatial foreign data wrapper and spatial data always has non-spatial data, you can use it to load non-spatial data as well. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is read a file from the internet. And, um, and GDAL has this, uh, this thing that you could call. So if your, um, your, your, your um, GDAL is compiled with curl, then you can use a virtual path and tell it that it's a file on the internet with this, just prefixing it with that. And so if I were to run this, it would load um, it would load a link to this file. And Postgres has this thing called import foreign schema. And this allows you to link in all the tables from a data source into your database like it's a, a regular table. And the OGR all is kind of a catch-all thing. It means load every single table that's in this data source. There are other ways. If you look at the um, 
the OGR FDW, you'll see that there are other ways to 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 limit what you load because if your file has many many data sources, many layers in 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 OGR terminology, then you might only want to do a subset. But in this case, we just have one. So if we run this, it'll tell you that it it linked in one table. And we can visualize that. And remember, this is a link. This isn't actually in our database. To bring it in as a physical table, you would create a new table from it. So I'm going to create a table called countries. And um, the OGR FDW always brings in geometries. Uh, spatial data is geometry, but I want it to be geography. And I know that this JSON data is in geography format. So I'm going to convert it to geography and just verify that I have what I think I have. And you can also use it to load in files from a URL and also from a, and that is zipped. So to do that, you would use this uh, VSI zip to tell it it's a zip file and the that it's on the internet and what kind of format it is. So here's a zip file that I downloaded from Natural Earth and I put on my local. Um, website. And so if I run this, it will link to the web to my local website. And again, I do the import. And it only imported one table because I only have one table in there. And this is all the cities of um, the world. And I, since I used select star, I didn't have the option to convert this to geography, but I could do it after the fact because OGR always calls the geometry column geom. So I'm just going to alter it using um, Postgres alter column and tell it I want it to be type uh, multi polygon. And the thing with shapefiles is they're a mix of polygons and multi polygons. So you want to use this st multi to force all the polygons into multi-polygon. And then I'm going to rename it because I don't like it called geom if it's a geography column. And now I have data and I can pick out Argentina. Uh, I'm in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And you can use it to load lots of files. So here's a file I downloaded from, uh, I forgot to put where it was. Oh yeah, so I downloaded it from GeoFabric. It's a OSM shapefile data set. And you see how it loads in. Uh, it doesn't, well, I had these tables built. So it's, so when you do drop server, it drops all the tables you had linked to that foreign server. So that's why you see all that drop cascade. But then I can bring them back in. And I have 18 tables. So if you look at my staging, you won't see anything here because foreign tables are always in the section called foreign tables. And you see I have a lot already. And if I were to check the staging schema here, the geometry columns view is something that's built into PostGIS. It tells you all the different um, tables you have. So you see I have all the foreign tables that are listed like they're regular tables. 
But if you look in the information schema tables, which is a, a, um, a view that's uh, ANSI standard, it tells you that they're not real tables, that they're, let me take this out. It tells you that they're foreign tables. So I'm going to build some real tables out of these tables that I linked. And you can see that um, this is going to take 10 seconds, I think. Yeah, so you can see that that um, PostGIS and OGR is actually pretty fast at loading. So I was able to load 720,000 buildings in under 10 seconds. And as with all spatial data, you should add indexes to make things faster. And I'm going to repeat the same with some of the other tables that I'm interested in. But the nice thing about linking to tables is you can inspect them before you bring them in. And you can also bring in just a subset of data if you don't, um, you don't want to bring in the whole table. Like I could put in a filter here to only bring in a subset of data. And I'm just speeding through this so that I can cover most everything that I wanted to cover. And this one's a little bit bigger, so it's going to take a little longer. So that one brought in over a million records. Okay, now we get to using PostGIS functions. So the most common function you'll find used are the measurement functions. And so there, there are a whole bunch. There's area, there's perimeter, there's length. I'm just gonna show the area one. And so for example, this one gives you the largest area buildings um, in the table, in the buildings table. And this one actually isn't even using an index and it's still pretty fast. And there's other functions like ST endpoints, and there's functions for making geometries lighter, having fewer points. And there, there are a number of these. So the newest one is the reduced precision, which requires um, PostGIS 3.1 with 3.9. And so if you look at the number of points, you start off with 347 and you get 26. So if we look at one of these, it looks like that. It's got more curves. And we look at the final, it's kind of boxy because I set this to what this means since I'm in degree in um, W in long lat is that 0 0.5 is measured in degree. So this is on a grid of 0 0.5 degrees. So that's why it looks very um, boxy. But the nice thing about reduced precision is that it keeps the edges more or less connected. Um, the most common function next to reduced precision, which, which has existed for a while, is the snap to grid. And if you look at it, 
it also kind of keeps things connected, except the problem with this is that you end up with a lot of invalid geometry. So if you look at it, you see a lot of them are invalid, whereas the reduced precision, you still have valid geometries after. And then there's the simplified preserved topology, which reduces the number of points even more. And it gives you valid geometries, but the problem with that is that you end up with holes. All right, I'm going to try to speed through this. Um, all right, so let me go through the, the uh, distance ones very quickly. Yes, please, Regina. OK, all right, so does anybody have questions? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> you can still show one example or two. But yes, we do have questions for, from the audience. OK, let, let's go with the questions, because people can always look at the code after. OK, so so uh, the first question is, is about the, the schema to install PostGIS. Uh, do you recommend to install in, in the public schema or in a specific schema? So I recommend install it in a specific schema, because the other reason is they're changing the um, permission thing in Postgres 4, 15. So if you install in public, I don't know what's going to happen. It might break your logic. So you should install in a separate schema from public. OK. So the, 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 the next question is also kind of technical. It's the difference between the, the GIST index and the SP GIST index. Can you oh. share some? Um, that one, I actually don't know the answer to, because every time I test it, on the data that I have, I get similar performance. Um, so I don't, I, I think um, it might be, we might have updated the manual to describe the difference. Because I think SP just, it's either supposed to be better if your data is more clustered or not clustered, but I can never remember, you know, if things are closer together or further apart, but I actually don't know the details. So. Your recommendation is to, to test both indexes and, and see which is the best for the specific. Yeah, because I hear data. different stories from people. So we have another question about how to decide the tolerance for preserved topology. OK, so the preserved topology, it's always in the units of the spatial reference system. And it's kind of hard. You want to get to the point where um, you Keep, more or less keep the fidelity, but you get um, you get enough reduction. And it really depends what you're doing because you don't want it to be reduced too much if you need higher precision um, accuracy. But then if you don't, you just want it to kind of look, then you want it to be very small, but it's always in the units of your spatial reference system. So you're better off doing simplify in a, in a true planar. So if you do like a, um, like a universal trans, trans um, like a UTM, that would be the best one to do a uh, simplification on. OK, we have one more question. Um, is the grid then the lying logical structure of the spatial index? Is the grid? No, it's not. So the grid is built separate. It's, it has nothing to do with the spatial index. OK. Regina, I, I think your presentation was quite clear. I already shared the, the link to your presentation in the, in the Venueless uh, interface. So I think uh, our, our attendees can see the presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite clear. <laughs> People are also invited to buy your new uh, edition of, of, of your book. So we'll move forward. And thank you very much, Regina.